The Problem of Evil by Vincent Chung Introduction One of the most overrated objections against Christianity is the so-called problem of evil. It claims that the existence of evil is logically irreconcilable with the Christian concept of God. The existence of evil is either assumed or supposedly established, and then this premise is said to be incompatible with the Christian concept of God. Thus it follows that there is no God, or at least it follows that what Christianity affirms about God is false. Non-Christians have found considerable success with this argument, and those who claim to be Christians are themselves op often disturbed by the existence of evil or the amount of evil in this world. Some Christians man manage to provide the plausible but inconclusive answers, whereas others evade the challenge and call the existence of evil a mystery. However, merely plausible answers are insufficient when the Bible provides an infallible response and invincible defense. And to the extent that the Bible addresses the topic, so that it is something that has been revealed, Christians have no right to call it a mystery, as if it is something that is still unexplained. The truth is that the existence of evil poses no challenge to the Christian doctrine of God or to any aspect of the Christian faith. Moreover, non-Christian worldviews, in fact, cannot make sense of the existence of evil if they can have a concept of evil at all. The Problem Christians affirm that God is om omnipotent, all-powerful, and omnibenevolent, all-loving, our opponents reason that if God is all-powerful, then he possesses the ability to terminate evil. And if he is all-loving, then he wishes to terminate evil. However, since evil still exists, this means God does not exist. Or at least it means that the things that Christians affirm about him are false. That is, even if God exists, since evil also exists, he cannot be both all-powerful and all-loving. But Christians insist that he is both all-powerful and all-loving. Therefore, Christianity must be false. There are different formulations of this argument, but regardless of the precise form that it takes, the claim is that Christians cannot affirm all the biblical divine attributes because this would be logically incompatible with the existence of evil. And the claim is that since this is the case, then Christianity must be false. Although Christians have agonized over this so-called problem of evil for centuries, the argument is extremely easy to refute. Even as a child, I thought it was a foolish argument, and it remains one of the most stupid objections that I've ever seen. Many people have trouble with the existence of evil, not because it poses any logical challenge to Christianity, but because they are overwhelmed by the emotions that the topic generates. And these emotions disable the minimal level of judgment and intelligence that they normally exhibit. Now, since our opponents claim that the problem of evil is a logical argument against Christianity, in our response we need to show only that the existence of evil does not generate a logical contradiction against what Christianity affirms about God. Although the Bible also offers answering reg answers regarding the emotional aspect of this topic, it is not our responsibility to present and defend these answers within the context of logical debate. So we will focus on the existence of evil as a logical challenge. Free Will Professing Christians, or those who claim to be Christians, often favor the free will defense. There are indeed different ideas of free will in different versions of the free will defense. Nevertheless, the slight adaptations, what I say in this section, will apply to all of them. This approach states that when God created man, he granted free will to the creature, a free will to even rebel against the creator. This is the ability to make decisions that are autonomous that are not always actively predetermined and directly caused by God. 
Of course, God was aware that man would sin, but this is the price of granting free will to man. By creating man with free will, God also created the potential for evil. But as the free will defense goes, since man is truly free, the actualization of this potential for evil is blamed only on man. This depends on the assumption that responsibility presupposes freedom. Since this premise has never been established and it is in fact easily refuted, the free will defense fails without further consideration. But we will continue with the analysis. In any case, it is said that the potential or even the actualization of evil is not too high a price for granting free will to man. Although Christians often employ the free will defense, and to some people the explanation sound reason reasonable, it is an irrational and unbiblical theodicy. It fails to answer the problem of evil, and it contradicts the Bible. First, this approach only postpones addressing the problem, in that it transforms the debate from why evil exists in God's universe to why God created a universe with the potential for such great evil. Second, Christians affirm that God is omniscient, so that when he created the universe and mankind, he knew not only that they had the potential to become evil, but he knew for certain that they would become evil. Thus, either directly or indirectly, God deliberately created evil. We may distinguish between natural evil and moral evil. Natural evil includes natural disasters such as earthquakes and floods, and moral evil refers to the wicked actions that rational creatures commit. Even if the free will defense provides a satisfactory explanation for moral evil, it fails to adequately address natural evil. Some Christians claim that it is moral evil that leads to natural evil. However, only God has the power to create a relationship between the two, so that earthquakes and floods do not have any necessary connection with murder and theft unless God makes it so. That is, unless God decides to cause earthquakes and floods because of the sins of his creatures, this occurred when God cursed the earth at Adam's transgression. So again, God remains the cause of evil, whether natural or moral. Even if Adam's sin had brought death and decay not only to mankind, but also to the animals, the Bible insists that not one sparrow can die apart from God's will. Matthew 10, 29. That is, if there is any connection between moral evil and natural evil, the connection is not inherent but sovereignty imposed by God. Even the seemingly insignificant cannot occur unless God actively wills it and causes it. Christians are not deist. We do not believe that this universe operates by a set of natural laws that are independent from God. The Bible shows us that God is now actively running the universe so that nothing can happen or continue apart from his deliberate power and decree, Colossians 1.17, Hebrews 1.3. In reality, there are no natural laws. If we should use the term at all, what we call natural laws are only descriptions about how God regularly acts, although he is never bound to act in those way, ways. Christians must reject the free will defense because the Bible rejects free will. Rather, it teaches that God is the only one who possesses free will. He says in Isaiah 46.10, My purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. On the other hand, man's will is enslaved either to sin or to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have been become slaves to righteousness. Romans 6, 17-18 Man has no free will. It is an assumption without any biblical or rational warrant. Another popular assumption is that moral responsibility presupposes moral ability. That is, 
If a person is unable to obey God's laws, then he should not be morally responsible for obeying these laws. And thus, God should not and would not punish him for disobeying these laws. However, like the assumption that man has free will, this assumption that moral responsibility presupposes moral ability is also unbiblical and unjustified. Referring to non-Christians, Paul writes, The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Romans 8, 7. If it is true that moral responsibility presupposes moral ability, and Paul states that the sinner lacks this ability, that it follows that no sinner is responsible for his sins. If a sinner is only a sinner when he has the ability to obey but refuses to obey, then since Paul says that the sinner indeed lacks the ability to obey, then it follows that a sinner is not a sinner. This is a contradiction, and it is a contradiction that the Bible never teaches. The Bible teaches that the non-Christian is a sinner, and at the same time it teaches that he lacks the ability to obey God. This means that man is morally responsible even if he lacks moral ability. Man must obey God even if he cannot obey God. It is sinful for a person to disobey God whether or not he has the ability to do so other or otherwise. Thus, moral responsibility is not based on moral ability or freedom. Rather, moral responsibility is based on God's sovereignty. Man must obey God's commands because God says that man must obey. It is irrelevant whether or not he has the ability or freedom to obey. Free will is logically impossible. If we picture the exercise of the will as a movement of the mind toward a certain direction, the question arises as to what moves the mind and why it moves toward where it moves. To answer the, that the self moves the mind begs the question, since the mind is the self and thus the same question remains. Why does the mind move towards one direction instead of another? If we trace the cause of its movements and direction to factors external to the mind, factors that impress themselves upon the consciousness from the outside, and thus influencing or determining the decision, then how is, it this, or how is this movement of the mind free? If we can trace the cause to the person's innate dispositions, then this movement of the mind is still not free, since although these innate, disp innate dispositions decisively influence the decision, the person himself has not chosen these innate dis dispositions. The same problem remains if we say that a person's decisions are determined by a mixture of his innate dispositions and external influences. If the mind makes decisions based on factors not chosen by the mind, then these choices are never free in the sense that they are not made apart from God's sovereign control. They are not free from God. Rather, the Bible teaches that God exercises immediate control over man's mind, and he also sovereignly determines all the innate dispositions and external factors related to man's will. It is God who forms a person in the womb, and it is He who arranges outward circumstances by His providence. Then it is He who controls man's mind and causes each decision that he makes. Therefore, although we affirm that man has a will as a function of the mind, so that the mind indeed makes choices, these are never free choices, because everything that has to do with every decision is determined by God. And on top of that, it is in fact God who directly controls the mind to cause every decision, since the will is never free. We should never use the free will theodicy when addressing the problem of evil.